It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, and yeah, a little bit more about me for you, those of you, most of you who don't know me. Um, I am Andrew, and I am in my day job, a principal engineer and astronomer working with Castle and Ash and plenty of other wonderful people. Um, in my sort of primary uh, side stuff on open source, uh, I've done a lot of work on Django, the Python web framework. Um, as well as having developed some of the new sort of Python web standards like ASGI. And I'm pretty new to Airflow. Uh, I actually started using Airflow when I joined Astronomer. And so I've only been using Airflow for about four months. And part of what I wanted to bring to this talk, as I'll show you in a little bit, is the things I've learned in those four months and sort of the architectural things and the things that you as a new user, or maybe an existing user wants to know more about the architecture of Airflow can understand. But before that, a little bit more about me and where I come from. So this is hosted by the London Group. I am from London originally, and at heart, I am and always will be a Londoner, uh, but right now I live in Denver, Colorado. Uh, Denver is a beautiful place. It's nestled at the base of the Rocky Mountains. And thankfully, so far this year has had having some wonderful weather. So when you can visit, I would love to encourage you to come visit at some point. But more than that, let's talk about this talk. So I wanna kind of do three things in this talk and sort of talk about these main things. First of all, high level concepts. To me, it's really important to look at a project or a piece of software and understand at the high level what it's doing, what it's trying to achieve. And in Airflow, there's a few, I think, key concepts that it took me a while to get that I want to explain to you as well and help you understand some of that stuff. Then I want to look at some of the good and the bad things about Airflow. So I've been doing software engineering and architecture for about 15 years, and I do not claim to be an expert by any means, but there are some things I think all of us who work on Airflow can agree are good, all of us can agree are bad, and some things that like it's maybe in the middle, but it's worth talking about and investigating. And I'll, I'll pull some of those out as well. And then finally, I want to focus directly on some of the problems and the fixes that can be done for them. So there's a few things here, and some of them you'll see in Ash's talk earlier in the day, um, his sort of keynote about the future of Airflow. I'll touch on a few of those here and a few other things about how the architecture of Airflow may change, as well as some of the potential ideas that may come as part of that. And a lot of this also is rooted in the differences from things I've worked on. So for most of my career to this point, I've worked on web and backend systems that power websites. And that is a very different kind of work in some ways to what Airflow does. In some ways, you know, it's real time versus batch. Like most of what I've been working on for at least the last five or six years has been directly in the request path of web apps. What that means is you've got a pretty small time limit to hit to get a response back to the user and you've got to be pretty available. Um, if someone turns up to your web server and it's not working, that's pretty bad. Obviously, you want good availability for Airflow too, but you can absorb like five, 10 second delays here and there. It's not the end of the world. And so there's a different trade-off and architecture and engineering is all about trade-offs, at least for software and in most other engineering as well. And that's one of the big ones I had to come to terms with and I'm still coming to terms with as well. Another part of that is like, the simplicity versus the complexity. Now, Django itself, along with Airflow, I think both of them, they are relatively simple concepts at the very high level. Like you can sort of summarize what they try and do in a couple of sentences, but both of them have very difficult pieces hidden away. So in Django, this is our ORM, our sort of object relational database mapper. It looks lovely. The interface is beautiful. It's a pleasure to use most of the time. And beneath it is just tens of thousands of lines of ridiculous, like ridiculous difficult code with transactions and all those kinds of things inside it. Airflow is very similar. Airflow at the high level, you might think, well, how hard can it be? I just have some tasks and run them in order. And then you open up the scheduler and you have to sort of take back a little bit and go, oh, actually, this is kind of much more difficult than I thought. And that's been my experience with Airflow as I've learned more and more of it. Finally, there is one thing in common, which is all still distributed systems. So I have worked on sort of big distributed systems for the past, I'd say five or six years or so, um, and various other companies before this, where I was like at single product, single sort of website companies. And there's a lot of similarity there, right? You have your standard trade-offs of like availability versus consistency versus like partition tolerance and all the other factors you design into an architecture. So like that's kind of the framing I came at Airflow with, and that, that helps somewhat. Um, you know, framing things in terms of things you understand is often a good way to start. But as 
we go on, you'll see there's other things I want to basically, you know, just talk about the differences in. But the one thing, the most true thing of nearly all software I've worked on is organic growth. Now, as software engineers, we want to sit back and go, I'm going to start a new project. I'm going to design it perfectly. I'm going to get it all right from the get-go. And if you're doing that, either you're a much better developer than I am, in which case, congratulations, and I'd love to hear from you, or you are kidding yourself. And in my experience, you're usually kidding yourself. Airflow was built inside Airbnb as pretty much an internal ETL tool. And it still bears some of the hallmarks of that design. Is that a bad thing? Absolutely not. Like Airflow was built and grew as its users demanded what it wanted. And that's a great thing. That's how you build software people want to use. The trade-off, of course, is that the architecture wasn't planned fully from the get-go. And so you have a few sort of nooks and crannies or problems here and there that you have to go and like go, well, we're going to go back and fix this and patch it up. And a big part, I think, of being a mature open source uh, software product is understanding how to do that in a backwards compatible fashion, as I talk about later. But that's the one thing I like. I will critique Airflow here. It is not meant to be an insult to those who've worked on it. It's more of a praise, I think. Like Airflow got to this point through the work of all those people. It's really important that it did so. You couldn't have done this another way, in my opinion. You could, like if you sat down and made a tool from whole cloth from scratch, great, you've done the easy part of the hard problem, right? Like the ramp up to where Airflow is now is the hard part. With that out of this way, let's talk about architecture. And specifically, let's talk about DAGs. So I presume most of you at this point are familiar with DAGs. Um, I'm a very visual person. So whenever I think about DAGs, I think about them in the graph view, like you can see here. And the key thing about DAGs is to understand that like, well, they're important in Airflow, obviously, um, but they're really in some ways a container for the tasks and the relationship between the tasks inside them. And I want to talk about how Airflow treats all these different concepts at a high level. Because when you write a DAG as a DAG author, you're authoring a Python file and you're writing operators and tasks into it. And that's one level of what Airflow understands. It's kind of a template, right? And when that actually runs, there's a different concept for that inside Airflow. And this took me a while to get my head around. So crucially, when you author a DAG and it's just on disk and ready to go, that is just a DAG. That's a standard thing we have in Airflow. But once it starts running, there's a thing called a DAG run, which is an instance of that DAG that runs at a certain execution time. Or as Ash talked about with AIP39, it'd be a bit better. But like basically, it's a DAG being run at a sort of moment in time with certain parameters and data. And most of what Airflow operates on is the DAG runs. Like the DAGs are the input to the whole process, of course. But the schedulers, one of the schedulers' many jobs is to look at the DAGs and their schedules, work out when the schedule comes around, and then kick off a DAG run. And once a DAG run is active, a lot of the rest of Airflow sort of flows from that. And that's kind of where the tasks and stuff come in. One of the other big things about tasks, uh, when I was reading the documentation initially, there was a lot of use of operator, a lot of use of tasks that were kind of intermingled. And it took me a while to sort of pull apart what the meanings were. And in some ways, they still are used interchangeably. But the way I think it's intended to be understood, and I've fixed some of the docs to reflect this, is an operator is a template for a task, right? It's like, oh, like, this operator will retrieve files for me. And when you, in a DAG, take that operator and say, like, ah, oh, you know, this task is going to be this operator with these parameters, you, you are taking the operator and instantiating it into a task. And then confusingly, when a DAG runs and turns into a DAG run, all those tasks, which are instances of operators, then become task instances, which are instances of tasks. And that sort of triple link took me a while to understand. I think it's very important to sort of get your head around. Because crucially, when you write something using, like, say, the task flow API, you skip that operator to task step. You're just writing a task directly. So like, I like to think of operators as easy task templates. But of course, you can author your own tasks directly as well. In reality, there's like the Python operator is involved, of course, and other things like that in some cases. But I find that that's a good mental model. And in my experience, that's held up pretty well with the architecture. And it's a bit like science in this regard, where like the actual way everything works under the hood is impossibly complex, but you can form a decent mental model that will get you 95% of the way there. I think that's an important part of trying to understand how airflow works. But this is kind of the basic understanding I have. Like, well, here's the main moving parts. And generally, 
what you're really sort of wrangling with is two different sides of airflow. The way I actually think about airflow, it's kind of two projects in one. Obviously, they're very tightly integrated, and that's a very good thing. It gives a great user experience. But one part of airflow is the scheduler. That's the thing that looks at your DAGs and your schedules, your dependencies between tasks, and it works out what to what to run, when it should run, and what conditions it should run on. Things like, well, this task depends on two parent tasks, or this task has a retry. Like that's the scheduler's job. And at some point, the output from the scheduler is a list of things that need to run now. And then we take those, we take them across sort of the virtual divide to the executor, and we tell the executor, hey, here's a list of things you need to run now. And it's the executor's job to take those task instances, find a place to run them, make sure that place can run them, make sure there's space on a cluster or launch more space if it's part of a scaling deal, and then actually run them and record the results. And so this is a useful way of thinking about if you must divide Airflow into two pieces, it kind of is logically two pieces. And between them is this interface of like, scheduler decides, well, I need to basically run these things, executor takes charge of running them. And the problem is, that's a lovely, lovely diagram that completely fails as soon as you look at the actual architecture of Airflow. Um, but it's not that bad. Basically, when I arrived in Airflow, I was like, OK, I have designed things like this before, much smaller scale, of course. Um, it used to be an interview question at one of my old companies we used to ask, like design a thing like this. So of course, there's going to be a scheduler. That makes sense. Most designs have that. And there'll be a separate process that orchestrates for how to run things, which of course is called the executor. That's not true inside Airflow. Um, Airflow actually bundles the executor into the scheduler process. I spent maybe six hours trying to work out how to run the executor when I first started on Airflow until I realized it runs inside the scheduler. And that's not, again, that's not quite true, as we'll see in a little bit. Um, but when you're running the local executor, which is sort of the default kind of basic idea, like, the default one is a synchronous executor, but it's a local version, right? Like, it takes the thing you ask it to run and just runs it on your machine. It's a very simple uh, piece of code. It's not that simple, but relatively, you give it a task instance, it just runs it and gives you the results right back. There's no networking involved, nothing like that. And so at your very basic level, Airflow looks like this architecturally. You have a scheduler process with the executor nestled inside it. You have a web server, which talks and talks to you and lets you do all your UI stuff if you want to. And between those, you've got two stores of state. Your database, which is your main store like metadata and what's running and where your DAG runs and task instances are and your XCOMs and things like that. And then you have your DAG files, which of course is where you author things and put them in. And those are the two main stores of state in an Airflow system. Now, of course, unless you're running a small cluster, you're probably not running the local executor. You're probably running something more like the Celery executor, like this. And once you bring in Celery Executor, you finally bring in more networking to your system. So again, we have our scheduler and our web server. They play very similar roles in almost every configuration of Airflow. Um, but we now have new stuff. So again, when a task needs to run, the scheduler hands it to the Celery Executor, which is still inside the same process. But Celery is an abstraction over task queues, things like Redis or RabbitMQ or those kinds of things. And so Celery takes that instance and shoves it into a queue data store separately. And then you have a set of separate worker processes. And those worker processes also query that task queue store and pull tasks out of it. And so this is kind of what I'd say is the traditional arrangement of how I've seen Airflow run. Um, obviously, there can be a Kubernetes in here as well. We'll talk about that more later. But generally, you will have these three main moving pieces, a web server, a scheduler with an executor inside it, and some number of workers. And that's kind of all you need to essentially run a decent little airflow. Uh, my work on AIP40 will change this. We'll talk about that at the end. Uh, but for now, it's just these three things. And if you use local, just these two things. So it's not too bad in terms of separate processes and network communication. But yes, first of all, please remember, the executor runs inside the scheduler. That includes things like some task callbacks. Uh, I think as Ash talked about, we're going to hopefully fix some of those. It's it's fine. Honestly, if you look at the abstraction, it makes a lot of sense. It's more like the executor is an interface to plug something else into rather than necessarily being a thing that runs by itself. So you could write an executor that had its own separate process. Totally possible to do inside Airflow. It's not really a it's not a bad design decision, right? It doesn't cut any avenues off. It's still pretty good in that sense. 
The other thing to remember, and I think this is a crucial thing to understand, Airflow leans very heavily on its metadata database. Now, you know, mostly I'd recommend things like Postgres for this, something else like that. Like they're very reliable, but there's no sort of distributed like gossip protocol discussion between elements. Like the web server doesn't really talk to the scheduler directly, it just talks to the web server. And the scheduler talks to the web server. And obviously the workers talk to the task queue, but also talk to the database. Sorry, they all talk to the database, my, my fault there. And that's very interesting. It is a single central point of failure, which of course is never an amazing thing in terms of architecture, but it also is a single point of coordination. You can have this thing where, well, everything understands that and we can use locking and transactions to make sure everything sees a consistent view of the world. So actually you think this is kind of a very neat thing. It makes Airflow a lot simpler. Imagine if that diagram I showed you had everything talking to everything else it would become much worse to run in terms of firewalling, in terms of security, and of course, in terms of working and testing it. So that's kind of the trade-off there. And I, I think I like it on the balance. The other thing is, as of Airflow 2.0, all three of those main moving pieces can be run highly available. The scheduler, of course, work was put in to make that HA, but that, as of 2.0, is highly available. You can run as many of them as you like, and it uses row locking in the database to make sure none of them is going to step on each other. The workers, by their very nature, obviously, you have to run many of them. That's how you run these things. So they always kind of have been in that pattern. And the web server, it's stateless. It's a good web server in that sense. It just talks to the database. So again, you can run as many of those as you like and scale them in the traditional web server fashion. So with that sense, a lot of Airflow's architecture is, by its nature, highly available. Database is the one thing isn't. But even then, the idea of running like an active passive setup for databases that's a reasonably well understood pattern. So you're not too much in the cold there. So let's focus a bit more, I think, on that scheduler executor split for a little bit. I want to discuss this more in terms of like difficulty and where there's work to be done. So first of all, on the scheduler side, this is, I would say, not my area of expertise. I mean, neither of these are, but it's even less of my area. The scheduler does a whole bunch of things beyond just working out what to run and when. Um, Ash is giving a talk on Wednesday called the Deep Dive into Airflow Scheduler. And so I have not done anything else here because I trust that he will do a much better job than I will of explaining all the intricacies of that particular piece of software. I've been in there a couple of times to implement deferred operators. I mostly understand what's going on, um, but there's still a few bits and pieces in terms of how it runs and how it makes sure it's self-consistent that's very tricky. And the scheduler is kind of that piece of code, like it's the linchpin of the whole system. It kind of holds everything together but you have to understand in great detail how it works to modify it really well. So it's kind of that kind of self-contained, very difficult piece of software. The executor, on the other hand, is a bit more open-ended. This is because it's pluggable, right? Like with Airflow, you get a choice of executor. You can do local or the synchronous executor. You can do Celery. You can do Kubernetes. Um, you can do the Celery Kubernetes. Both of those combined. And that's kind of a very different, interesting take where like it's had to have a very clear interface of like, this is how an executor talks to the rest of Airflow, to the scheduler generally. But beyond that, you can kind of do your own thing. Now, right now, uh, we do have two main offerings in Airflow. We have the Celery executor and we have the Kubernetes executor. And they are a little bit different. I want to discuss their differences and trade-offs quickly because like, this is an important thing. When you think about how your DAGs run to understand the difference between these two systems. So the Celery one, as I mentioned, the tasks go into a queue. The workers pull from the queue and run the tasks. Everything lives, sort of lives in this uh, quick, pretty quick low latency system. The workers continuously live on and just do one task after another. They, they don't restart between tasks. So you lose a little bit of isolation or security in that sense, but they're very, very quick. There's no latency to like boot up a new worker every time. But they're just chewing through tasks as they come in. When you go to Kubernetes instead, though, we run each of your task instances in its own pod. And it takes a while, once you've injected a pod into Kubernetes, for it to notice, allocate the pod to a node, spin up the pod, and then run the task inside it. So you get a lot of good isolation out of that. But your trade-off is it's a much longer latency for startup. And that's kind of the sort of the balance, right, of these two executors. Um, the Celery Kubernetes executor tries to sort of walk the bridge between them. I think it does a pretty good job in that sense. 
Um, but I also think that there is more room uh, for innovation on this front where like we can probably try and get the best of both worlds in that sense in some other way. And that may be a future talk at some point. But let's talk about exactly how executors do handle task instances. Because if you go to the docs, uh, the concepts documentation in the Airflow documentation site, you will see this diagram, which initially is incredibly confusing and baffling. Um, but the key thing to understand is the blue boxes here are very helpful. So if you look, the first blue box says scheduler. And what that means is those are the decisions the scheduler makes. So when a task, well, so when a DAG run is made, when you, when you start your DAG up to run today or the end of the month, whatever, all the task instances inside it I have no status. That basically means unscheduled is what that means. And then when they're ready to go, that basically means like when all their previous tasks they depend on have succeeded or failed and the rules are correct or whatever, the scheduler comes along and pops them into either scheduled, if they're ready to go, it pops them into removed. I believe that's if the task has vanished from the DAG in the meantime, which things like versioning of DAGs will fix that particular problem. And it might put them into upstream failed, which means, well, it depended on a task and that task failed. So this one's just going to fail instead. And that's kind of the point where, like, if a task gets scheduled, it gets handed off to the executor. And it's the executor's job at that point to take the task from scheduled to either success or failure. Now, if it's got a queuing working system, that middle section here with the queued and the worker, that will come in and it will go into a queued status, what's in the queue, and then the worker will pick it up. If you've got a local one, it'll just jump to running immediately. But the point is the executor takes it from schedule to running and it then monitors the results and then it works out if it succeeded or failed. And of course, if you fail, um, you may also retry. That's what the bottom loop there is. And if you are a sensor of the reschedule type, which is a very specific situation, um, you can suspend yourself and go up and back to the scheduler. And of note, when we implement AIP 40, it's the same path that deferred um, operators would take as well. You can be like, hey, I'm not finished running yet, but I don't want to run right now. Come back and start me later. So you kind of, you kind of kick it back to the schedule. You free up the work or free up the executor. So that's kind of the flow of how the different states move around. And the key thing here is, as you can see, the executor never, ever knows what a DAG is. It's basically dimly aware that DAGs exist. It has to load them off disk, obviously, and find things inside them. And they're basically opaque IDs. But honestly, a large part of Airflow's model is task-oriented and task-instance-oriented. Um, DAGs are a bit more than just a grouping mechanism. Um, but when you look at the uh, sort of implementation inside Airflow, DAGs, they're kind of the input to the system. And obviously, they're a place to find things and part of the identifiers. But they're not really a core part of scheduling per se. They just happen to be a thing that exists around the edges. So one of the things I found helpful when working on Airflow is generally just think in terms of how, how do tasks flow through this thing? And how does this task depend on things before it and depend on things after it? And once you've got that figured out, your DAGs will fit into that model pretty well. So that's kind of a, a nice thing about working on Airflow itself. Now, Airflow has some strengths and weaknesses. Uh, very flexible runtime environments is both of those. Um, it's great. You can do anything. It's also a problem because you can do anything and we're not sure what you're doing. So I think there's a little bit of work here in terms of making it a bit more aware of what's going on. But honestly, I think it's really more of a strength than a weakness here. They're like, yeah, you can just, as Ash said, put Terraform in there. It's perfectly fine. Um, it's, you know, I'd love to teach Airflow a bit more about what you're running and Maybe how it can interpret failure or interpret progress, right? Like, oh, it's halfway through. It'd be a nice thing to know about a long running task, but we'll get to that. So, in terms of a quick look at things I think uh, might change in the future architecture wise, obviously, uh, more async and eventing. Anything that involves waiting for a certain thing to happen should probably be async because it saves you a lot of resources in your cluster. And so, obviously, AIP 40 is the first part of this. We have further plans, like things like you know the event-based um, DAG triggering is part of this too. So that's that's kind of part of what's important. The main trade-off is I do add a blue box to my lovely diagram. Where there's now four things to run. There's a triggerer up there. The triggerer is the extra process that runs all the async stuff, but it is highly available. So that guarantee of everything being HA still applies, which is nice. So we haven't broken that at least. The other thing is. You may have seen all the arrows in that diagram go to the database. Now, this is generally fine from a design point of view. 
Databases tend to be connection limited, however. So we'd love to remove those connection limits and move it back to an API. Because again, web servers and APIs, we know how to scale. It's a known problem. We can make it a lot better, and we can share the database handles and sessions. So that's like one of the big architectural changes is to take all these arrows and point most of them over at the web server, and maybe just have the scheduler talking to the database directly, because it has to do blocking and stuff like that. I do like central database. It's nice. Um, there are probably improvements to be made on it in terms of like how we maybe just use more than one or like having different contention, or maybe having an option of a distributed like NoSQL one. But there's a lot of benefit in building on very proven technology. Like Postgres, I often joke, is one of the few pieces of software I trust my life to, right? It's incredibly reliable. So there's a lot of benefit in that particular aspect. And one of the things I want to stress in this talk here. Software engineering is not just coding. I have not mentioned any single line of code in this talk because software architecture is not a coding thing. Um, and I want to stress that like, when you are working on software like Airflow, writing code is an important part of that process. It is not the only part of that process. You need people to understand the big picture, to write documentation, to convey concepts, to do things like coordination and like just do project management. And so I want to just stress here at the end of the talk, a big part of Airflow is not it being an amazing architecture. It's it's pretty good and can be improved. A big part of it is the backwards compatibility, the maintenance, the guarantees we can give you. Um, I know from you know Jan Django is like 15 years old, like last year or this year, we have always been backwards compatible in Django. Airflow has striven to be very very similar. Like you have to break things occasionally, but like that's how you gain trust. That's how you build good software. Can you go and write a brand new thing from scratch? Looks like, looks like Airflow. Of course you can. Do you want to? No, you'll run into all the same issues we did, right? Like as soon as you get to having hundreds of providers and loads of things moving around, guess what? The same kind of problems come up. So it's my belief that like taking airflow, maintaining it, making it better over time is the real way forwards here. And I really want to stress that's done by people like you as well. I joined into Airflow four years ago, uh, four months, four, four months ago. Um, I haven't been doing very long, but like I've got a few commits in. I've got a big one on the way. And again. It doesn't have to be code. I also refactored a lot of the concept docs on my way, way in as well. You can help triage bugs or like do QA and testing and things like that. There's a lot of things you can do to Airflow um, beyond just writing code into it. And I'd love to hear from any of you, as I'm sure many of us would here uh, who work on Airflow and help you out with that stuff. But with that, that's the end of my talk. So thank you very much.